When did you start with Steve Hammer, or pre Steve Hammer, as, oh, yeah, as, your, first, as yeah. your first performances? Yeah. Um, well, we had our number one actually in France, uh, Steve Hammer. Uh, I, start, I started as a painter, really, that was the idea. And I, was, I, I just got, a, I thought I'd get a job playing in a band uh, and support the painting. So I play at night and paint in the day. And, um, I think I, I think Stephen must have been advertising for somebody because I. Oh no, I started with Rick. With Rick, um, that was the first thing. With Rick from um, Super Trump. And he was advertising for somebody to do a, um, a gig in Switzerland. So I went up and sat in this uh, place in Nottingham Gate, okay, I think it was somewhere like that. And, uh, there was all these saxophone players in a, in a row, you know, it was like being at the dentist, really. Trying <laughs> to, to do that a little bit. And Rick was there, and uh, another guy who joined, who he turned down um, Jimi Hendrix and decided to join up with Rick. And that's what it was like in them days. And uh, surprisingly, I got the job. I didn't think I would, you know, I couldn't really play anything. I just sort of just blew around, you know. And uh, off we went to. Have you had a bit of classical education on flute or no, otherwise? Really not or really, no, no, just no. teaching yourself. Uh, no, by that point, I, I just teaching myself. I started playing the piano at, at art school. Just, you know, stealing time in the piano in the hall there. And, and um, Steam Hammer, you, I mean, it's one of the psychedelic bands that almost, it was sort of blues mm. psychedelic. Well, style. they were back in Freddie King before I joined, um, and then he disappeared. <laughs> but, um, well, that's more like a funk soul sort of blues. style. They're very blues. much blues, and um, yeah, they, they, they're all into the blues thing. But it was such a powerful band, you know, in them days, yes, mid-60s, we were playing every night. <coughs> it, the band would start off and it was just like an explosion, you know. Great big orange jams that my aunt would stand up this high, you know, and it was just a great band live. Didn't come off on the albums as much as it did live, but there again, we got a number one out of it, and, uh, and I think this the album did well. wonderful clip is on uh, YouTube of playing it's on just television. Just suddenly turned up. Television, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's what that number one. With um, Sir Gainsbourg sitting on the stage yeah, with right. a fag hanging out one, yeah. one side of the and Jane Birkin sitting next to him with a fag hanging out the other side of the yeah. yeah. Uh, looking up at uh, Steam <laughs> and Steam Hammer, you know. So yeah, that was the. Um, and at, at what point did you go to Berlin and work with uh, Edgar oh. before your better known stint in the band? Well, what happened? Well, we we were doing this. Um, probably going to be here all night by this thing. <laughs> 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 we were doing this um, residency in this little club, and we got there and. We had an apartment opposite, you know, just a real dive. And uh, it just woke me up to rock and roll. I mean, it was just awful. And just talking about wanking and, you know, and lighting farts and stuff like that, you know. I, I, not not as sophisticated, I'm sorry. Well, the worst, well, you know, part of it. You know, we'll go through that. And, and then we got into the club, playing in the club. This was with uh, Rick, you know, who, after, the, we were called The Joint then, uh, for obvious reasons. But, um, uh, uh, we started playing in this club at night, you know, three or four nights, and then sort of light and farts the rest of the time. And uh, I've never seen to get any money or any food. I was just starving. You know, I just started eating the bloody sugar lumps off the table to try and get some sort of sustenance. And um, and uh, and then suddenly this film company came in and sort of, you know, looking for somewhere to party. And they came in and sat down and they came up and said, oh, do you fancy doing some music in a film? And I was like, now, yes, please. <laughs> yeah. And they took us off to this really nice hotel, working in a castle and... Um, Suddenly we had three meals a day, they rented this cafe just for us to eat, and uh, it was called The Happening, the film, it had to be, didn't it? And it was 
in this castle, and they had all these, like, they had a live tiger there. He came and attacked the assistant director. <laughs> it was completely freaked out. And uh, then they, the director said, oh, we're going to cut a chicken's head off, you know, in the middle of a... And I said, there's just no way I'm going to let you do that, you know. <laughs> Not that I had any sort of strength of, um, to stop anything, but he did, did agree, so that never happened. And then the, the guy that wrote the music for the film, David Llewellyn, he was a well-known composer, and uh, I got on well with him because I did all the sort of, you know, the melody lines and everything, and we seemed to hit it off. <coughs> and um, he said, well, what are you going to do? I have a film to finish, you know. I said, well, I don't know. I, don't know. I, I really want to study music, you know. I mean, my favourite person is Bach. That's all I want to do is learn about that, you know. He said, oh, OK, here's the key to my flat. Go to Berlin. Let yourself in. I've got a uh, Steinway Grand there. <coughs> Just hang out there. I'll come back and we'll see if we can get an appointment with the uh, Hofschule. So I did that. <coughs> got to know some people there. You know, there's a couple of sax players that played with them. Um, <coughs> they were on tour with the um, Beach Boys. <coughs> oh, God, they were good tenor and uh, alto player. And uh, uh, then I went to the, the, the Hochschule and the Conservatorium and, uh, and they said, well, what are you going to play? I said, well, I don't, can't play anything. I can't read music, you know. I said, well, I just improvise to you, you know. So I had these five prof professors sitting around in this really horrible place. <coughs> and, um, they just sat there staring at me and I just played the piano for 20 minutes, stopped, and they never said a word, not that. So I walked out of there, nobody said anything, and I thought, well, that's the end of that. And uh, the next day, I heard that I'd been accepted and was the first person there that had ever been accepted that couldn't read music. <laughs> Which didn't help, really, because I got there and, the, you know, my piano teacher was like... <clears throat> He had this hair lip, I remember, and he was like a sort of Nazi, you know, and he was like <laughs> shouting these things at me, you know, and he'd put this Beethoven snarter in front of me. I don't like Beethoven much anyway. And, and I was going, <laughs> you know, and he was looking at me and he said, what the hell is this bloke doing here, you know? He can't even read music, you know? So I had to go home and learn this, this thing by heart, you know, come back and play it by heart. And my composition teacher, well, he, he was just into having somebody come and um, have tea with him. You know, as soon as I got there, I thought, Ooh, we have tea now, we have tea. You know, really into the whole English. <coughs> and he said, oh, play me your composition, so I play him this piece of music. He said, oh, that's lovely. Can do me another one. And it was all about the, having tea. You know. <laughs> I never learned the bloody thing. You know. the, only thing the only thing I got was, oh, that's very nice, thank you. Go and get do another one now. So that was going on, and you know, obviously I was, in, I was sort of thinking about electronic stuff then, because it was sort of like all music concrete then, you know, I was always into something that was a bit different. And I'd heard that something was going on in this studio in Berlin. So I just went over there and. Uh, got into the studio and um, <coughs> there was this guy doing music concrete and a whole load of tapes set up in the studio and I was having a chat to him and talking to him and there was this guy sitting in the corner looking really miserable and uh, I said oh what's happening you know he said oh my band's just uh, broken up I'm not sure what to do now and uh, I said well let's start a three piece um, his name was Edgar Frozen. And uh, so we decided we'd, we'd find a drummer and do a three piece and start traveling around Germany doing something a bit different. We got this old Farfisa organ, there was no synths in that time, of course. And um, had two or three different drummers. One of them used to wear these big black boots, you know, and as a black guy, you know. And uh, he didn't seem to last very long. And then Another Swedish guy came along and used to throw his cymbals all over the, around the gig, you know. I think he's going to chop some of his head off, you know, so we've got to get rid of him quick, you know, so he'll end up in prison. And then this young, skinny guy came along, who was, you know, a bit young, and I thought, 
I said to him, I'm not sure he's racist. He no, we you know, he said, I like him, he's a nice guy. And he is a nice guy, actually. I, said, I still like him a lot. And that was Klaus Schultz. So there was just the three of us, Edgar, Klaus and myself, and we went travelling all over Germany doing these gigs. And that, in them days, it was like little, uh, these little clubs, you know, like this sort of, sort of, even smaller than this, and they'd have hundreds of TV sets all running at the time, same time and stuff like that. And it was a magic time, absolutely magic. And the good thing about that is it took you away from the classical necessity to learn pieces because they were, waste of time. Oh, they, were they were asking for improvised music and you, you go out and jam every evening. And of course Edgar Pfizer was on a psychedelic electric guitar and Klaus Schwartz was on drum kit. It was even yeah. quite some time before any use of electronics. And um, then you went uh, back to UK and yeah. various other places. Klaus, Klaus, Klaus was like a clockwork toy. You know, he'd sit down on his drums and he'd just be off and he wouldn't stop for half an hour. You know, and it's just <laughs> Very powerful. One of the big yeah. things about him is his, his right foot on the bass drum pedal was fantastically uh, fast yeah. and powerful and he could uh, uh, do that for three quarters of an hour yeah, at a time. Very, very it's a very difficult thing to do if you uh, haven't worked on it. And he was a young man, you know, he was a yeah, yeah. And of course, he's, I mean, he's very uh, striking, Klaus Schultz, he's about six foot four. And yeah. I think in those days, he's very skinny as well, so he's got yes, like a huge beef boy. Well, Edgar was like a lack, so of, lack of food. Yeah. No. Yeah. Edgar's always quite uh, yeah. uh, cuddly. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, no, I, I mean it, because he had this sort of big uh, teddy bear mane of ginger hair and things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, and of course, Steve was called back in 1978 after um, Peter Bone had, had left to go yeah. uh, to the USA. And uh, Mary, as it turns out, no one just found this out, uh, the daughter of an oil billionaire, um, I think the third wealthiest man in Chicago, and his daughter was a, a, a slightly a confused supermodel type. And I think uh, Peter Bowman kind of uh, rescued her from living a fairly dis dissolute life. And um, at the end of the conversation, she said, well, of course, I get $2 billion off my father when he passes away. So Peter Bowman, surprisingly, did not continue with his music career all that uh, <laughs> uh, uh, carefully. But he's uh, big in real estate, and I think he had the largest house sale in Chicago a couple of years ago. He sold a $17 million house. Um, there was talk, of course, after Edgar Fraser died, of somebody coming back and rejoining Tangerine Dream, either Jerome Fraser or uh, Peter Bowman. But I think that lasted uh, a very short time. It didn't, it didn't work out. Um, but Steve, of course, had been taken on in, in 1978 when the idea was to try uh, an acoustic drum kit, very good drummer called Klaus Krieger, who played with Eden Pop and other bands. And um, Steve on uh, uh, flute and, and saxophone and vocals. And this is a big deal for Tangerine Three because they had almost had no vocals at all. They built their reputation as a uh, synthesizer band. And I always felt that having a layer of voice and flute and uh, acoustic things, as we were doing earlier with the cello, is lovely over uh, electronics. And I thought Cyclone was one of the best albums they'd, they'd turned out. And you, in fact, Steve, had done the majority of the work on it, hadn't you? Because they didn't have a lot of ideas at, at the time of what to put out next. I keen on the way it was going, but, you know, I mean, Edgar said to me when I first got there, he said that sales are going down a bit. Can, can we do something that we might draw in a few more people? So I didn't expect to keep the vocals. I mean, it was just one of the ideas. And Edgar said, well, yeah, we should keep them. And so that's what happened, really. But... A lot of the time they weren't there. I was just sort of, you know, I mean, like Rising Runner, for instance. I played pretty much everything on that and wrote it while they were having tea somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're a bit worn out um, uh, at the time. But I always felt that if they had stuck with your angle of, of having vocals and uh, winds and other instruments, that they would have uh, turned more into a, a Pink Floyd sort of band if you had vocals, because yeah. it opens things up to so many more people. Let's face it, there's, there's a, a limited number of people who like uh, purely instrumental music, 
Well, funny enough, um, I, I've always hated the vocals, you know. I was used to think, oh God, I wish they'd get the vocals out, I just hear the music, you know. Mm, I used to love yes. introductions, and as soon as the vocals came in, I hated it. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously on things like uh, uh, Pink Floyd, that would have been a potentially wider market to have yeah. songs in their uh, sense as well. And um, so, yes, I mean, I'm sorry, we have to admit that the... Uh, poor acceptance of adding vocals to Tangerine Dream um, led to that experiment being discontinued, didn't it? Yeah, I as far as I know, I've not really heard anything since I left, really. But, uh... yeah. Well, of course, uh, on Virgin, I expect the, um, you know, any label from any band always says, let's do something a bit more commercial, and uh, obviously doing songs within their format would have been a step in, in that direction. Yeah. I just feel it should have been yeah, uh, kept and worked on yeah. for a good few years. We were all quite happy at the version of that. I mean, Richard was a great guy. To, I liked him a lot. Got very well with him. Uh, yeah, I think in, in sales it actually turns out to be the fourth or fifth most popular Tantrum Dream album, despite the uh, you know lack of acceptance yeah. at the time. It's been uh, uh, reassessed since then and I think it uh, stands up well. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows how it would have developed, you know. The vocals might have gone in the end and it would have just been a key, but it wasn't to happen. And, and one thing you mentioned to me was the sheer tonnage of equipment and, and crew to <coughs> go around and do those tattering dream oh, shows with all the keyboards you'd have asked about. I think there was three big Arctic trucks, uh, two cars, another two little vans, 30 rotors, and then a a roadie for each, personal roadie for everybody for each. Um, yeah, massive. And I mean, all of the gigs were very packed. I expect there's one or two people here that were actually there. But, uh, well, I haven't badged so much. The 1978 badge, which actually I carefully packed away when we did this show last year and forgot to put the bloody thing on. <laughs> so the badge had to wait another year. I didn't even know. Was that one of the badges from then? And and so after that, um, the technology made it a, a lot easier for uh, composers to work things like the Insonic workstations. You got into it at a very early stage. And I just have this thing about it. making the most of little things. You know, it's always been a sort of thing. Of mine. And I like that old workstation idea. I did a few albums with just. Using, you know, I mean, when the N-Sonic came out, it was the SQ1, it was just everything in the box, you know, I just love to sort of push that to the limit. Yeah. Well, you also spent a lot of time in the USA as well as the UK doing open air shows and all kinds well, of things. Well, I do, I do do some uh, exhibitions now, which uh, yeah. combine my paintings and video and uh, music all together. Wonderful. And it means I can sit around and people just walk around and look, yeah. and I haven't got to do anything. People should um, <laughs> look, look at your website. I've always been a lazy bugger. Yeah. 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 People can look at your website for details of art gallery exhibitions yeah, coming up and so on. Yeah. And um, if anybody failed to notice, Steve's CD that he's uh, selling tonight, instead of being mass produced, is um, hand painted. So each cover is unique. Is that fair to say? Totally. They're, they're absolutely individual. So whichever one you have, nobody else in the world will have that one quite the same. And they're all numbered as well, so it's a limited edition that we have. At the back. Uh, I just was very curious about the instrument played in the first part of your performance. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, when I was with TV in 78, uh, there was an instrument that came out that was called the Liricon. And it was made by a small American company, uh, which uh, I was very interested in. It looked great, it was sort of made all chrome and everything. And uh, and they said they'd supply me with one. I don't know what they do, I can't remember. Um, they wanted to fly me over to, to sort of demonstrate it and all that stuff. And I said, well, I hate flying, so no, just send me the instrument. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was really very expressive because it actually got transducer in, in, in your uh, mouthpiece that turns your breath into an electronic signal and also pressure on your lip, which obviously you can access that to different uh, uses. 
and different things you do with your fingers. So it's very expressive. It's a great instrument. Um, <clears throat> I came back to, when I left TD, I came back to, and uh, I met uh, one of the guys from uh, Moody Blues, the sax player. He said, I want to buy your Lyricon. I said, well, you know, you can go around the corner and buy one. You can still buy them, you know. They, they, I know they're going out of business, but he said, no, I want yours. <laughs> <laughs> he gave, gave me this great wad of cash from Lyricon, you know. I thought, oh, well. I haven't been paid any money from Tangerine Dream, so I better, I better take it. You know. <laughs> Uh, and then, and then Yamaha bought out Lyricon, and they bought out this thing called the WX7, and uh, so obviously I got one of them. I've had three or four of them, and then this one I played tonight. Yamaha actually gave me, which is uh, was very good. Um, so it's, uh, a, it's a wind control uh, device, which sends yeah. mid MIDI now in the modern version. Yeah. And uh, Steve's uh, synthesizer was, was inside the, the laptop called uh, Omnisphere. So the, the laptop is capable of, of doing three or four things simultaneously. So getting that wind sound is one of them. And you, they're do, doing a guitar and then a, a human voice and so on. They're all, all part of the software. But you know, you need to be a good wind player to, to play these fluently. They're not. Uh, not for the beginners, no, no, no. Well, it's, it's not unlike playing any instrument, really, you know, because you're controlling the same thing, so. Everybody's got, yeah, every instrument has a certain amount of uh, technique that you have to master, but... Um, and when, when you went out in 78 with uh, <coughs> Tangerine Dream, you also took, um, on stage, you have a clavinet and a modular system, I <coughs> always liked the harpsichord, and the, the, the clavinet was a sort of like, Poor man's harpsichord, really, you know. Uh, and the fact that it was electric was awful, really, because it made a lot of noise, background noise. But, it's know, basically a punk machine, and I don't think well, punk is allowed in Yeah, yeah so you know. put it to alternative use. Yeah, I played it more in a classical way, really. Yeah, yeah just the barbier has got one of the Roman system 700s. Yeah. It's like a big box, yeah. yeah. This was a tiny version of it. Yes. Because I always remember when I first joined the Dream that time. I got to the rehearsal rooms and set this thing up and Peter Bowman came in and sort of looked at it and burst into laughter. And down his nose again. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, what the hell is that? You know, because he's so used to having this stuff up there. And Edgar stuck up for me and said, no, it's bloody good, you know. So I think uh, uh, we're winding up. We'd both like to thank Chris for a wonderful event for organising. <laughs>